The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, a revolutionary new way to treat cancer. You need to do this. And it's already saving lives. I think I cried for probably the first week. Then... I was just dead inside. A single mom's long road to recovery. I had nothing left. Ends with a fateful crash. That just shook something inside of me. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. President Trump is denying Iran's claims that the 17 people it arrested are CIA spies. Trump also says Iran's continued provo provocations are making it harder to find a diplomatic solution. As Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, the standoff between Iran and the West is all part of a high-stakes geopolitical confrontation in the Persian Gulf. And that could lead to armed conflict. Iran released images of what it says are CIA spies, some who face the death penalty. President Trump called it fake news. That's totally a false story. That's another lie. We are ready for the absolute worst. Iran also released footage of Britain's captured ship, the Stena Impero, and its crew. U.S. Secretary of State told veterans the U.S. will continue to enforce its maximum pressure campaign on Iran, including sanctioning a major Chinese company. We've said all along that any sanction will indeed be enforced. We can't tolerate more money going to the Ayatollah, putting American soldiers, sailors, airmen and Marines and putting their life at risk. It's too important. After the seizure of a British tanker and the recent downing of an American drone, President Trump says negotiations are becoming less likely. Frankly, it's getting harder for me to want to make a deal with Iran. One Iranian expert told CBN News Iran is waging a small war against the U.S. and the West. The goal is to keep the war small enough in order to outlast President Trump and the West. They also calculate that President Trump won't want a war with Iran with presidential elections next year. The danger is they could miscalculate the situation or underestimate U.S. resolve. Iran's foreign minister says the tanker threatens safety inside the Strait of Hormuz and added Iran wants normal relations with England and the world. Iran does not see confrontation. Iran wants to have normal relations based on mutual respect. Meanwhile, inside Iran, the U.S. economic sanctions are affecting Iran's economy, a situation some call catastrophic. This year is worse than any other year as far as I can remember. The inflation and rising of prices that we've experienced over the last seven, eight months is unprecedented. It's too much to put up with. For its part, Britain says it plans to build a European coalition to safeguard shipping in the Strait of Hormuz and hopes for a diplomatic way forward. The setting for this geopolitical showdown is one of the most important in the world, the Strait of Hormuz, where one-fifth of the world's crude oil passes through each year. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, Iran is playing a very um, dangerous game of chicken with the West, and they're taking advantage of two things. One, we have a presidential election coming up, and their gamble, if you will, is that President Trump won't do any military action uh, until after that election. Uh, the second thing they're counting on is that uh, the EU and the United States won't be able to get to get together. And it's very significant that the UK is now saying they're looking just to uh, European partners to try to contain Iran. They're leaving the United States out. That is a, a, a monumental thing in international diplomacy that a NATO ally is saying we want to go it alone with the EU at the same time they're planning their exit from the EU. So that shows just how far the divide is and can the U.S. still put together an international coalition in order to stop Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. And that's the ultimate game. If Iran becomes nuclear in the next year and a half, then all bets are off. And any kind of military action, you have the state of Israel standing hostage uh, to any kind of theater war 
in the Middle East. And if they continue to develop missile technology, they will literally have the EU in their sights and can lob a nuclear weapon into the EU. Uh, this is a game changer, and it's been what everyone has been worried about for decades. When Iran gets a nuclear weapon, then the whole dynamics of the Middle East, the whole dynamics of Europe changes overnight. This is something we have to stop. That's why the sanctions are in place. Uh, that's why President Obama tried to negotiate a nuclear deal. Uh, and what are we going to do if we blink on this one? That's uh, catastrophic. It's catastrophic, not just for the Middle East, not just for Israel, but for world peace. Well, in other news, the United Kingdom has a new prime minister, and Iran is the first challenge that he will face. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John. That's right, Gordon. And that new leader is Boris Johnson, chosen by Britain's Conservative Party to lead both their party and the country. He's an American supporter and has defended President Trump. And he's vowed to make Brexit happen in three months. But as Dale Hurd reports first, he has to deal with Iran. Boris Johnson arrives at number 10 Downing Street at a challenging time for any new prime minister with fears that war could break out with Iran. Iran's Revolutionary Guard seized a British-flagged oil tanker in the Strait of Hormuz last Friday, revenge for the British seizure of an Iranian tanker off Gibraltar earlier this month. But Boris Johnson has already signaled he's no hawk on Iran. During last week's TV debates, Johnson said he would not support U.S. military action against Iran. And in 2018, then Foreign Minister Johnson traveled to Washington to try to persuade President Trump to stay in the Iran nuclear deal and said the British government remained committed to the deal. As for his pledge to leave the European Union by October 31st, no matter what, Johnson inherits the same divided Conservative Party in Parliament that helped stymie and finally bring down Prime Minister Theresa May. Johnson may also be handed a no-confidence vote and early election within weeks. But he does have a friend across the Atlantic. I like him. I like Boris Johnson. Boris, I spoke to him yesterday. Uh, I think he's going to do a great job. I think we're going to have a great relationship. And that irks a lot of people in the British establishment. A BBC interviewer tried to get Johnson to say something bad about President Trump. When he wouldn't, it prompted this exchange. Wouldn't you be as craven if you were prime minister? I've been, you know, to, towards the United States of America, to, craven. Towards anybody who's powerful uh, in the don't, world. Don't be ridiculous, uh, if I may say so. Uh, when, when it comes to sticking up for UK interests, whether it's over climate change or over disputes with Iran, over the Iran nuclear deal, uh, we have been very, very forthright with the United States of America. In 2015, Johnson accused Trump of stupefying ignorance and said Trump was unfit to hold the office of President of the United States. The former mayor of London, known for his occasionally wacky style, has adopted a populism that so far has served him well. But now as prime minister, he must navigate through an international crisis as possible war clouds loom. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. Well, here at home, President Trump says he's working with the Prime Minister of Pakistan and other countries to pull America out of Afghanistan, adding that it's going to take some time. We're not fighting a war. If we wanted to fight a war in Afghanistan and win it, I could win that war in a week. I just don't want to kill 10 million people. Does that make sense to you? I don't want to kill 10 million people. I have plans on Afghanistan that if I wanted to win that war, Afghanistan would be wiped off the face of the earth. It would be gone. It would be over in literally in 10 days. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to go that route. The president said he uh, the U.S. does not want to act as the policeman in Afghanistan. Well, Congress is expected to vote on a new budget deal before it leaves town next week. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and the White House reached an agreement yesterday afternoon. It allows the government to continue borrowing money to pay its bills and sets funding levels for the next two years. Critics say it does nothing to rein in Washington's out-of-control spending. Earlier this week, the White House said it expects deficit spending in 2019 to reach $1 trillion, and the overall federal debt is expected to hit $22 trillion. 
The Trump administration is taking stronger measures to deport people living in the United States illegally. The so-called fast-track deportation will bypass immigration judges, allowing the removal of anyone who crossed into the U.S. illegally and does not have an asylum case or case pending in the immigration courts. The rule, which goes into effect today, applies to those who've been in the country less than two years. That time limit is part of a 1996 law that authorized expedi expedited deportations. Well, the controversy over the recent ouster of Planned Parenthood's president has sparked fresh debate over the organization. The group has long argued it's about providing health care to women. But when former President Lena Wen tried to make that Planned Parenthood's main message, she soon found out that its real mission is protecting abortion. Heather Sells reports. Dr. Leanna Wen's departure highlights what critics of Planned Parenthood have said about the organization all along. It is more about abortion than women's health care. The mistake that Dr. Wen made, unfortunately, is the same mistake that thousands of American women make every year. She trusted Planned Parenthood when Planned Parenthood said it was all about women's health care. Dr. Wen wrote in the New York Times this week that she was asked to leave for the same reason she was hired, changing the direction of Planned Parenthood. Wen didn't want to just promote abortion. She wanted to care for women's health across the board. I thought it was an interesting move when Planned Parenthood hired Dr. Leanna Wen. I think they were trying to uh, give themselves some credibility hiring a physician. But they really need an activist because they're really not in the business of promoting health care, even, even providing uh, standard health care. They're in the business of abortion, period. Wen's ouster comes as Planned Parenthood faces mounting challenges. Already this year, nine states have passed abortion restrictions. In Arkansas on Monday, a Planned Parenthood attorney argued against a new law requiring abortion doctors be board certified or board eligible in obstetrics and gynecology. If they are allowed to go into effect, they will in all likelihood shut down abortion or most of the uh, legal abortions in Arkansas. Wen had advocated reaching out to those with more nuanced views on abortion. In her op-ed, she wrote, we need to stop treating those whose views differ from our own with scorn and suspicion. Heather Sell, CBN News. Thanks, Heather. Gordon, back to you. Well, it just goes to show the um, propaganda campaign that's been going on with Planned Parenthood for some time. Uh, if you remember the uh, restrictions that were uh, attempted to be passed by Congress uh, just a few years ago, and then the drumbeat, well, uh, Planned Parenthood is about women's health, and it's about breast exams, and it's about all these other things. Uh, that was a continual drumbeat to try to justify the hundreds of millions of dollars of federal money that goes to Planned Parenthood every, every year. And so to see the ouster of this new president who was trying to actually make that real, to say let's do something about reproductive health and not just do abortions, well, you, you see the effect of it. And then on top of that, to have uh, the Arkansas Planned Parenthood argued that you shouldn't be a physician. Uh, you shouldn't have a specialty in OBGYN uh, in, in order to perform abortions. Uh, well, where's women's health in that? And if you can't have normal health regulations uh, and normal protections uh, for women going through these procedures, well, then what are you really about? And it, it's been what the pro-life movement has been saying now for decades. What they're really about is abortion. And they're really about abortion in poor areas, which goes all the way back to Margaret Sanger and eugenics and what was the founding of it. Uh, we need to curb uh, population in low-income areas. Uh, that's what this is about. That's been the game for decades. They've been hiding it for decades. And the amazing thing to me is people haven't awakened well, this is what they really want to do. Terry? Well, coming up, a 40-year-old mother of three hears stunning news from her doctor. He said, I believe you have a large tumor in your colon. And he said, I believe that your, uh, your cancer from your colon went into your liver. Hear about the experimental liver transplant this woman underwent and meet the stranger who became her donor after this.
Well, we've been getting calls and letters that uh, I've been hosting the show and my father has been absent and uh, people are inquiring, is he okay? And the answer is yes, he's okay. He's taken some time off in order to write a book and he's also taken some time off just to get a vacation. Uh, he is 89 years strong and he wants to continue hosting. Uh, so he's going to be back the first full week of August. He's going to come back from vacation and host the show and host the show for many more years. Well, colon cancer is striking more and more young people. And we've got a good story for you because the woman you're about to meet was diagnosed with an advanced case soon after her 40th birthday. But thanks to an experimental liver transplant, she's doing just fine. As medical reporter Lori Johnson tells us, she found her donor from an unusual source. On the outside, Carol Matika looked like the picture of health. In 2016, she experienced pain following a strenuous hike and visited the doctor. Expecting a minor report, the diagnosis caught her totally off guard. He said, I believe you have a large tumor in your colon. And he said, I believe that your, uh, your cancer from your colon has went into your liver. And he said, this is probably the worst case scenario. The good news? Surgeons removed the diseased portion of Carol's colon. Since the cancer had spread to her liver, however, doctors told her chemotherapy was the only option. Given the average survival is just two years, Carol's first thought was her family. My kids, certainly. So they instantly came to my head. Am I going to see them grow up? Then, doctors at the Cleveland Clinic told her about a new option. Carol was eligible for an experimental liver transplant from a live person. Basically, it consists in removing about 60% uh, uh, of the liver from a healthy person, a healthy donor, and transplanting that uh, uh, part to a person that is in need. Given her desperate situation, Carol started looking for a donor. Her pastor at St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Van Wert, Ohio, wrote about Carol's need in the Sunday Bulletin. It was like the very second that my eyes saw that and started reading it, just had this feeling come over me that, you know, this is going to be you, you need to do this. After tests, Jason learned he was a perfect match but doctors warned him there were risks. There's about four to six uh, patients in a thousand will die as a result of living donation. Jason still agreed to the transplant, even though he barely even knew Carol. It was a blessing to me. I think I cried for probably the first week. The difficult surgery was a complete success. Carol and Jason, who are now good friends, both recovered beautifully and feel great. You know, it's given me the chance to see my John, he's graduated now, and my Joseph is going to graduate, and my Nick is at Dartmouth, and I didn't know that I would get to see Drew graduate from high school, but I get that opportunity now because of what Jason has given to me. So many people have come up and said, you know, it's so great what you did, and it's amazing, you're such a great person, and um, it's, I always have to like step back I'm like, no, it's not. You don't understand that I was called to do this. Thanks to the transplant, doctors estimate Carol's chance of survival increased from 10% to 60% after five years. Great news for Carol and many others facing a similar diagnosis. In addition to the surgery, doctors also conducted genetic testing on Carol. They found what they believe can cause colon cancer at such a young age. Doctors now know mutations in the bumper 1A and SMAD4 genes can cause polyps to form in the colons of teenagers. If left untreated, these polyps can develop into colon cancer, which can spread to the liver. Since these mutations are usually inherited, Carol's four children also underwent genetic testing. Doctors learned two carried the problem gene. Both then underwent colonoscopies, at which time doctors discovered problems and treated them. Jonathan um, had several polyps removed, 
Joseph, who was 20 years old at the time that he had um, the the colonoscopy, had three precancerous polyps. And so through my diagnosis, what a greater gift could I give as a mom besides teaching my kids to love Jesus and to be compassionate young men? I was able to give them life again. They will never have to deal with this. They will never have to go through what I've had to do. Carol hopes to use her story to convince young adults to learn more about their family's health history and undergo genetic testing and colorectal screenings if necessary. Lori Johnson, CBN News. What an amazing story. What an amazing sacrifice. And what an amazing diagnosis. Just a short while ago, Carol's diagnosis was literally a death sentence. There wasn't anything you could do uh, once the cancer has spread. How, how, do, how, do you, how do you deal with that? But to have just this wonderful volunteer. And pastors, please let your congregation know needs. Uh, what an old tech way of doing it in the church bulletin. But to read the church bulletin and have God speak to you in that, saying, this is for you. And then, amazingly, you're the perfect match. And then you say, yes, I know I can die. I know the procedure is risky. But at the same time, I have to do it. I have to uh, give uh, what I can so that someone else can live. And then to have genetic testing, have the diagnosis, what a wonderful thing. Uh, it's amazing what's happening in our world today. It's an exciting time to be alive. At the same time, we still need the church bulletin. Terry? Well, up next, a single mom loses her home and custody of her three children. I was pretty much using every drug I could get my hands on. I didn't want to live anymore. I was, I was completely dead inside. I had nothing left. See how she found help in a hopeless place after this. Our new DVD from CBN Documentaries follows the trail of the treasures of the Second Jewish Temple. And in this segment, the journey leads to North Africa, where the treasures were taken after they were looted from Rome. Take a look. The Jewish treasures remained in Rome's Temple of Peace until 455, when the Vandals invaded Rome and emptied its treasury. They will come from their capital, which was Carthage. They come to Rome and they start to loot the city, to take all the marbles, all the treasures, whatever they could. Hence the name vandalism when we want to speak about a destruction. I don't know if they really knew what they were from their point of spiritual point of view. With Roman ruins, the Vandals sailed home to Carthage in North Africa, and historians say they took the Jewish treasure with them. Procopius writes that the leader of the Vandals placed an exceedingly great amount of gold and other imperial treasure in his ships and sailed to Carthage. And among these were the treasures of the Jews. Get your copy of Treasures of the Second Temple Available now. Well, the DVD is available now, and we're asking for donations for it so that we can fund future documentaries on the archaeology of Israel, uh, the wonderful films that we're doing. Uh, it's all made possible because people like you care enough to donate. So for a donation of any dollar amount, you can have Treasures of the Second Temple. So call us now, 1-800-700-7000 or just go to cbn.com slash treasure. Terry, over to you. Brianna Bowman became sexually active at just 11 years of age when a man twice her age violated her. Her life not only got worse after that, by the time she was 24, Brianna was a single mom with three kids and a drug addiction that eventually left her with nothing. It, it was devastating. My heart was broken, like my whole world was shattered. I was looking at everything that happened throughout my life from this pinhole of pain at that point. Um, it was just complete brokenness. Growing up, Brianna Bowman felt loved by her parents. But when she was eight, her parents told her they were divorcing. 
Both of her parents focused on their new relationships, leaving Brianna hungry for love and attention. I was taken advantage of by a man who was in his mid-20s and at the age of 11. I didn't know that that was wrong. He was just showing me attention. So my uh, perception of love it was based on the physical act of intimacy and being sexually involved with a partner and the feelings that came from that. She started smoking marijuana at age 11 to help cover her pain. I had felt really lonely and I was seeking um, attention. I, I just wanted to feel different than what I was feeling. She got the attention of boys and was pregnant at age 14. The teenage parents struggled to raise the baby, and after four years, they went their separate ways. Brianna continued her search for love in an abusive relationship. I felt like my only worth, the only worth that I ever had was uh, just to be used for sex or to be abused. I was seeking love. I was looking for love in every single thing I could possibly try to find it. and. I was left emptier and emptier to the point of I was just dead inside, just dead. At age 24, Brianna thought she had found the love she was missing when she got married. They had two daughters together, but her husband left them for another woman. That was really devastating for me. Um, it was even more devastating to my children. And I started using methamphetamine. I hadn't realized that I was an addict or an alcoholic until I actually chose to stick a needle in my arm. And that was when I, I knew that something was really wrong with me. As a single mom with three children and an escalating drug addiction, Brianna knew she needed help. When I asked for help, CPS became involved. And when I tested dirty, uh, they told me that uh, my, my children would have to be removed from my home. My son was like floating around. Um, from place to place and running away, and it affected him greatly, negatively. I ended up losing our home, and so the day that I packed everything and moved what I could out of our home, I went to rehab. Brianna was in and out of rehab several times and continued to relapse and go back to heavy drug use. I was pretty much using every drug I could get my hands on. Um, it was just like a garbage can at that point. I, I didn't want to live anymore. I was, I was completely dead inside. I had nothing left. During that dark time in rehab, a ray of hope came into her life. There was a, a woman who had come from a local church and she would come on Saturdays and do a Bible study. And she kept telling me, you know, like that God loved me. I was learning more about who Jesus was. Um, I still was a non-believer, but she said, just if you're sitting in your room, just call out to him. You know, like you can, you can ask him for help. Um, and so I would do that. She attended the Bible study for several months, but one day Brianna witnessed an event that shocked her. After avoiding a car accident, she saw a man die right in front of her. That, that just shook something inside of me. I mean, seeing somebody's life, and here I was throwing mine away. That night, I went home, and I processed a lot, and I had began to realize, like, the reason that I was still sitting there was alive with everything that I had done was because of God. That week, Brianna gave her life to Jesus. She says she finally found the love she had been searching for in Him. I have felt a sense of pure love, like the, like something, everything that I was looking for in every bottle, every man, every syringe, everything was like right there. And I just felt completely fulfilled. I just remember feeling clean. I felt well, like completely forgiven. While in rehab, Brianna was accepted into Acres of Hope, a renewal center serving homeless women. It was there she was able to reunite with her children and lay the foundation for her new life. When I graduated, to see the look on my son's face and my daughter's, like it made everything that I had been struggling through this entire time worth it. That was for sure the best day of my life. Brianna and her daughters now have their own home. She started volunteering at Acres of Hope and was eventually hired full time counseling women who are facing the same issues she had. I get to be here to walk them through uh, along their journey and to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And I get to share the gospel with them and how good God really is. He has transformed and taken every single thing that I've 
walked through in my life, all of the hardship, all the struggle, the heartbreak, and he has completely transformed it. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. It's, it's absolutely amazing. What an incredible story of restoration, isn't it? You know, we were created in the image and likeness of God and in relationship with Him and meant to live in a garden with Him forever. Given free choice, because God doesn't want robots as His children, He wants us to choose whether we'll love Him or not, to choose whether we want a relationship with Him or not. To be able to choose that means we also have the ability to choose not to have a relationship with Him. Sometimes we make those choices by not choosing anything at all. You know, our actions choose them. The decisions we make choose them. In Brianna's scenario, she lost everything, everything, almost lost her life in the process. And then that one instance where she saw a man whose life was gone, woke her up to say, I have one life, what am I doing with it? You know, that's a question at some point we all need to ask ourselves, isn't it? I have one life. I'm put here with intention by a God who loves me and has plan and purpose for me. Am I walking them out, that out? Am I actually experiencing that? Or am I making choices on my own that just keep leading me into deeper and deeper water? Maybe you can relate to Brianna, not because you've gone through all of the exact things she did, but because you aren't finding an answer to that emptiness inside, to that deep longing to be loved, to know that you have purpose and meaning in your life, that sense of dignity that you are valued. You see, with God, He's our Father, and we get all of that. He loves us with an everlasting love, says He'll never leave us or forsake us. If someone's left you or forsaken you in your childhood, if someone's violated you in some terrible way, you can have a brand new beginning. Only God can heal those places in our heart that are broken so that we stop hurting ourselves, stop hurting others, and begin to live the abundant life that Jesus said He came to give us. If your life's not abundant, then you're not, you're not getting all of the blessings and benefits you were created to receive. How do you start that process? You know, you just come to Him, just be real. He already knows you. He already knows where you've been, what you've done, where you fall short of the mark. Just confess it all to Him and say, Jesus, I need you. I want you. I'm choosing you today. The Bible says God chose you, so now you choose Him back. Give it all to Him. I like to picture an altar before Him where I can lift up the junk that I'm dealing with and put it on the altar and say, Jesus, I'm giving this to you. And when we finally let go, He begins to move in our lives because we're giving Him freedom to do that. Ask Him today to touch you, to forgive you, to heal you, to fill you, to use you. It's all available to you for the asking. If you've never prayed a prayer of commitment to Jesus, or if you're not sure what life looks like once you make that commitment, we have a packet called A New Day. It's our free gift to you. And you can get it by calling the toll-free number on your screen, 1-800-700-7000. Pray with the person that answers the phone because they've already made the commitment we're talking about. And then ask them to send you this. We'll get it out to you right away. Gordon? Still ahead, how to create the life you want with your words. International speaker, author, and pastor Catherine Ruinala tells us how to speak life into any situation later on today's 700 Club. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. In Puerto Rico, citizens continue marching in the streets for more than a week in an effort to drive Governor Ricardo Rosseo from office. Hundreds of thousands of people arrived Monday in what's now considered the largest protest ever in the U.S. territory. 
Protesters are demanding Roseo's resignation over a leaked online chat he had with allies and federal corruption charges leveled against his administration. The march comes after Roseo announced that he would not quit, but has promised not to seek re-election or continue as head of his pro-statehood political party. President Trump joined the public, law clerks, and Supreme Court justices to honor former Justice John Paul Stevens yesterday. The president and First Lady Melania Trump paid their respects following the ceremony for the late justice, who lay in repose in the Great Hall of the Supreme Court. The former associate justice was 99 years old when he died last week. He was the second oldest serving justice when he retired in 2010. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Da's daughter was so sick she passed out. Doctors refused to treat her. Neighbors refused to help. So Da had to take out a high interest loan to save her daughter's life. Daw is a widow. To provide for her daughter, she works long hours at this clothing factory in Myanmar. They were getting by on her meager earnings until her daughter, Wynne, got sick with a high fever. I gave her medicine to keep her temperature down. But then I came home and found her unconscious on the bed. Daw took Wynne to the hospital, where a test revealed she'd contracted dengue fever. But the doctor said without further payment in advance, they would not treat her. Daw quickly went to family and even neighbors to borrow money. They refused to help. They were waiting for me to bring home my daughter's dead body. Daw finally was able to borrow the money, but at 20% interest per month. Wynn recovered after 28 days in the hospital, but then Daw had to face their growing debt. Every day, we ate only one egg and a little rice. I could only afford to pay the monthly interest on my debt. Working with the local pastor, CBN's Orphan's Promise paid off the family's remaining debt and gave them a new sewing machine so Wynn can learn to sew and Daw can earn extra income from home. Daw and Wynn now attend church together and both recently prayed to become Christians. I used to dread waking up in the morning because I was so anxious about money. Now, everything has changed. I'm so grateful to Orphan's Promise. Orphan's Promise is CBN's outreach to vulnerable children in the world, whether they're orphaned or vulnerable because of poverty or, or some other lack in their family. You know, when you join the 700 Club, you're a part of reaching out to people right at their point of need all around the world every single day in thousands of places. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. If you haven't joined yet, you're missing out on the greatest deal in town because together we can really impact the world. We want to invite you to join with the rest of us today. Our number is toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Just call. Say, I want to join the 700 Club. When you do, we want to send you Pat's teaching the plan. I think you're going to love this. Eight keys to understanding God's will for your life. And if you'd like to give specifically to the work of Orphan's Promise, just designate your gift when you send your check. Just put in the memo line, Orphan's Promise, and we'll be sure that your gift goes to helping children who are uh, in compromising situations and not growing up healthy and well. Our goal is to take them from at risk to thriving, and we can do that with your help. Gordon? Well, up next, change your words, change your world. Author and Catherine, Catherine Ruinala joins us to talk about the power of the tongue and how you can use it to speak life into any problem. Well, according to one study, we have about 80,000 thoughts a day and 90% of them uh, we've had before. 80% of our thoughts are negative but we can fight those negative thoughts with positive words. Take a look. Catherine Ruinala and her husband, Tom, are founders and senior ministers of Glory City Church in Brisbane, Australia. She's also the host of her own TV show. Over the years, she has taught about the power of the tongue and how positive and negative words can shape the reality around you. 
In her book, Speak Life, Catherine shares practical steps on how to deliberately speak faith-filled words over yourself, others, and your circumstances so you can bring God's promises into existence. Well, welcome back to the 700 Club, our dear friend Catherine. It's great to have you. It's yeah. a delight to be here. Thank yeah. you for having me. All right. Well, let's get right to your book where you li you say we can literally shape our wor world with what we say. Well, the Bible says that you and I were created in the image of God who created the world with his words. And then in First John, it tells us that as he is, so are we in this world. And Proverbs tells us that the power of life and death is in our tongue and that we'll eat the fruit of what we say. So I am very vigilant about using our words to really speak life. And instead of calling things as we see it in the natural, grumbling and complaining, by actually calling things that be not as though they are, we can partner with heaven to see the creative power of God released in our lives. Why, why do we go the other way? Because if the psychologists, psychiatrists are right, if 80% of what we're thinking is negative, uh, that has to express itself through our mouths. It, 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 it begins yeah. with our thoughts. And so wh why are we oriented to the negative? Uh, well, you know, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And what you look at is what you reflect. You know, we're like, we, we reflect what we are beholding. And so that's why the Bible says, set your mind on things above, be deliberate to think on things that are pure and lovely and of a good report. And so we've got to be vigilant to realize we're actually in a war and uh, we need to take captive every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. That is anything that isn't the will of God for our lives needs to not occupy our thoughts. We need to grab it, cast it down and deliberately start thinking about what is his will? What does he want? Well, we know the Bible says that he wants us to walk in, uh, wants us to prosper and be in health, even as our souls pro prosper. So we know, okay, the will of God is that I'd be healthy. So I need to start imagining myself healthy. I remember once um, having stiff fingers when I woke up in the morning and the enemy started to say, oh, you're gonna be like your mom who had arthritis. And so I immediately just began to picture my fingers as a 90 year old woman playing the piano and declaring my, my joints are supple. And so we need mm. to be deliberate to change our thinking and then line our words up with the truth that God wants to release in our lives. I remember me, the light bulb going off. I was reading some of the Desert Fathers and, you know, this third, fourth century, they'd go off in isolation in Egypt and, and live in the desert. And then it just dawned on me what they were wrestling with what were their own thoughts. Mm. Um, what are the sources of our thoughts? You know, I really believe that when we receive Jesus as Savior, we are delivered from us. Hallelujah. It's no longer we who lives, but Christ who lives in us. And that's why the Bible says we need to renew our minds because so often we are so conditioned to just be looking at things in the natural when God wants us to have a perspective of being seated in heavenly places with Him. And so as we, as we recognize, no, we are not victims of our circumstances, but that the promises of God are invitations waiting for our response, we can change the way we think and be deliberate to go, no devil, I'm not going there. I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to put my mind on what the will of God is. So for example, um, I heard a testimony from a lady who'd been through a divorce and she was hearing this uh, message about speaking life. And she realized that night, she just got so convicted. She realized, she said, I, I think I destroyed my marriage with my words. Mm. Her husband had lost a whole lot of money and she told him, you're terrible, you make terrible decisions. How could you do this to our family? You're such a fool. So instead she went back to him and said, I, I just want to apologize. I've done the wrong thing. I realized I, at that time I should have been speaking life saying you, you have the power to make great decisions. You're a, you're a good decision maker. And you know, as she started to change her thinking and change her words, they started dating and they, you know, their, their <laughs> marriage is back on track. And, you know, it, it has so much power. I hear people talk about their children. Oh, my kids are lazy or they're, oh, they're not doing very well. They're not very intelligent. You know, you might be thinking that because you're looking at circumstances, but if instead you grab a hold of the will of God that says we have the mind of Christ, 
you should be speaking over our children by saying, my children love God. They, they have wonderful characters. They're bright. They're intelligent. And it's not denying a reality. It's actually making way for the will and the purpose of God to be um, manifested in their lives. What do you say to the critics who would say, you're just talking mind over matter and that, you know, it, 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 how, how does this work? Well, you know, there are a lot of secular books that use this principle because there is there is power in our words. It is a biblical principle. But the difference, I believe, is that we're not just applying a principle. We're connecting with God who who wants us to intimately know and have faith in one that isn't a concept, but is a reality. And in knowing him, we can have confidence. I know this is what God wants for my life. I know these are the desires of God for my life. So I'm going to line my words up with, with what heaven is saying. You know, the Bible says that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are interceding for us continually in heaven, according to the perfect will of the Father. And, you know, I just imagine, like to imagine what that might look like. I don't think they're up in heaven begging the Father to do something. They're, they're all one and in perfect harmony. And so I, I imagine they're talking about the plans that they've got for my life and what they want to see. Uh, isn't it wonderful? We're planning these good things, these, these good works for her to do. But their yes in heaven requires my amen on earth. So the promises of God are invitations, not necessarily inevitabilities. As we begin to recognize, what are you saying, Lord? You want to see me lay hands on the sick. It's in the Bible. These signs shall follow those who believe. They lay hands on the sick and they recover. So that's the invitation. My response needs to be calling things that be not as though they are. So I start to say, I lay hands on the sick and they recover. I see people get out of their wheelchairs and walk. And you know what? We are now. It is so exciting as we're seeing the purposes of God actually manifesting on earth as we simply, in a childlike way, come into agreement with our words, with what God is wanting to see happen for us. I like to tell people it's not mind over matter, it's God over matter. Absolutely. He spoke it into being and He can speak anything into being. And I love what you say. All we have to do is amen Him. Yeah. All we have to do is say, yes, Daddy, I'll go along with that. Yeah. And I believe you can do that. You are the God of the impossible. With you, all things are possible. Let's just hold that. And yeah. with that, you can move mountains. That's the truth. He said, light be. And there was light. And in the same way, we need to be careful. I, we like to play a game. We, um, we go around the circle calling things that be not as though they are and making declarations. So I was doing it this morning as we were getting ready um, to come on here with the lady that was doing my makeup. And we were, we were making declarations. I'd say things like, all of my children are married to godly spouses. And she'd say, my, my brother is walking with Jesus. And I'd, I'd declare, well, my brother is loving Jesus too. And, and actually saying it as though it already is a reality is, is lining ourselves up with what God's like. In the book of Romans, it says, God calls those things that be not as though they are. So I think we should play a game, Gordon. Okay. I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll go first. I get better at this <laughs> all game all the time. All my children are married to godly spouse. I'll beat you too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. And um, all my children love Jesus more than I do. <laughs> I'm going to hold my grandchildren in my arms. Oh, I, all of my yeah. grandchildren and my, my great-grandchildren love God and follow Him. I get healthier every day. Yeah, yeah. Your turn. My turn? <laughs> I get smarter every day. <laughs> That's a good one. I actually say that. I get more intelligent every day. I, I, I have wisdom from heaven. God gives me wisdom and I walk in wisdom and I make wise yeah. choices. I'm going to see the future today. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. And people who come in contact with me today are going to experience the kindness of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> All right. Well, Catherine's book is called Speak Life, Creating Your World with Your Words. And you can get that wherever books are sold. You can play that game, too. And if you want to see her live, she's going to be at Rock Church right here in Virginia Beach tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Here's a word from Proverbs. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit.